2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're in part 2 of getting ready for what's to come. And, you know, we know Jesus is returning because he said he would. Remember when he left the disciples, he was speaking to them and giving them the, their last standing orders. And then he descended, he ascended into the clouds and they watched him as he went. And the angel said, the way he left is the way he'll come. And so we look, we look to the coming of Jesus Christ because the Bible tells us to. Tells us to live ready for it. And I, you say, well, when's he coming, Pastor? I don't know. It could be tomorrow. It could be a thousand years from now. You say, but the signs of the times, the signs and the puzzles all fall into place. Absolutely it is. But only if the Father knows when he'll let that trump sound and he'll send Jesus. Amen? Amen. Come on, church. you got to preach back to me this morning. Amen. Amen. Shake it off a little bit. We're still Pentecostals in here. Hello. Bunch of Methodists in first service. I had a... Use the Holy Ghost jumper cables to get them going. Amen. Nobody likes the frozen chosen. There's no statues in church. So getting ready for what's to come. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4, uh, the Apostle Paul is telling the Thessalonian church, they were looking for his coming. You say, Pastor, but those people never saw Jesus return. No, but Jesus got them because when they died, they went into his arms. Amen. So either way, we die or he comes to get us. He's coming and we need to live ready for his coming. So let me read to you 2 Thessalonians 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. Uh, this is part two of this message, so you, some of this should sound familiar to you. But it says this, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. That's what Jesus is coming to get his bride, to gather the church together. Verse two, That you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Let's just stop right there. So talking about the coming of the Lord, and the apostle just encouraging the church with three instructions and you say why is he giving these instructions because their world was like our world it was tumultuous and there was pressure and the heat was being turned up there were many false prophets in that day saying oh jesus is coming back meet us in the desert or you know jesus already turned you you guys missed it or some of them were saying i am jesus and we've still got some of that today in the earth. People uh, throughout, you know, the decades, there have been people who claim to be the Messiah. And, you know, they started cults and they led people astray. And they had a lot of that then. And, and he gives them these instructions. The, the heat is turning up. Remember last time we were together, the first one was that we should not be quickly shaken. You and I as Christians should be the most, uh, you know, emotionally, mentally stable people that there are. Hello? You and I have no business being weak, no business being confused, no business being shaken, amen? Because we have Jesus Christ, the truth. We know why we're here. We know where we're going. We know who saved us, amen? We know on the other side of this life is heaven. There's a world out there that doesn't know that, and they are confused, and they get shaken quite easily. And, you know, the first one deals with our mental stability. You say, what makes a Christian mentally unstable? Not enough word, not enough prayer, and not enough faith. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you, listen to that online or however you can get it, but get it in you. God wants us in this hour, in the middle of confusion, to have mental stability. Number two, the second instruction the apostle gave the Thessalonian church is this, do not be disturbed. Now, if you've ever seen someone who's disturbed or you've been disturbed, don't raise your hand, this is not the altar call, you know that when someone's disturbed, you can tell. They can't hide it. Why? Because they're coming unglued. We talked about mental stability. The Christian should also have emotional stability. Sometimes we can wrap our mind around the right theology and we know about Jesus and we feel safe with that. But emotionally, we can't handle life. And that shouldn't be, I mean, there are times where all of us get overwhelmed, but you and I should have emotional stability. People, Christians who aren't emotionally stable are wrestling with two things. They overthink things and they are dealing with a spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Come on, church. How's your mental stability today? How's your emotional stability today? 
in Christ, it can be solid. The third instruction the Apostle Paul gives us is this. Do not be deceived. This deals with spiritual stability. So we have mental, emotional, and now spiritual stability. Do not be deceived. Now, the way he says this here in the text, let no one in any way deceive you. Implicit in the way he says that, if you examine the text, it's showing us that if we are deceived, it's a matter at some point of choice. We're going to see that we have a choice in whether or not we're deceived. That's why it says, don't let anyone deceive you. Why? Because you have a choice in the matter. And if you become deceived, there's some personal responsibility in that deception. So now that I got your attention this morning, and you're all looking at me like a cow staring at a new gate, let's take a look at this. So here's what he's saying here. Implicit in it is that there's a choice and there's personal responsibility. If you and I wind up deceived, that means we've ignored all the speed bumps, the red flags, and the warning signs that the Holy Spirit's put up for us. You know, you and I, even before you were saved and the Holy Spirit was wooing you, you you had a level of discernment where it was your conscience that God put in every man that when you were about to do something that was wrong, you knew it was wrong. Come on, you didn't have to, you know, somebody didn't have to sit down with you theologically and say, you know, you shouldn't steal your neighbor's stuff or you shouldn't lie to your spouse. You knew that it was wrong. What is that? That's the internal witness of the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit, the, the umpire and the referee of your soul. He, what is he doing? He's giving you a red flag. He's blowing the whistle. He's giving you a speed bump. There are warning signs there. So if you and I wind up deceived, that means we've ignored the speed bumps, the red flags, and the warning signs. Have you ever been deceived by someone before? Did you ever discover someone was different than what they appear to be? Come on. Did you ever date anybody? Now everybody's uncomfortable. And you, you get, you're getting to know a person who think, aren't they wonderful? At the beginning, everybody's wonderful. That, that's the demo model. And then all of a sudden you realize they're not who they projected to be. And all of a sudden you went from, I can't be around them enough to, I got to get away. Oh, is it hot in here? Is it, did you stay up late? You know, people have a way of tricking us, whether it's in business relationships or dating relationships or any kind of relationships to where they appear to be one thing and turn out to be another. All of us have experienced that. And so, you know, this whole thing about deception, if we ignore those speed bumps and the red flags and the warning signs, we have some personal responsibility in the fact that we've become deceived. Let's look at spiritual deception. We're going to find out why people are deceived spiritually. He says, don't let anyone deceive you. They're going to tell you Jesus came, Jesus is coming, meet us out here. I'm Jesus. They're going to tell you all kinds of things. Don't be deceived. Spiritual deception, let no one in any way deceive you. Yet multiplied millions of people this morning are deceived. And our generation is deceived spiritually. There are cults and there are world religions and they have deceived people for generations into believing two things. Number one, Jesus is not who he said he is. Every cult, every world religion, every philosophy, every new age uh, ideology that's out there will attack the divinity, and the significance of Jesus Christ. Theologians call your belief about Jesus your Christology, what you believe about Christ. And what the enemy does is he'll, he'll start a, a movement, a cult, a church with a, with a whole lot of truth in it, but just take out the validity of who Jesus is. Oh, Jesus wasn't who he said he was. He wasn't the only begotten son of God. He wasn't the Messiah. He wasn't the person who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but me. No, Jesus is not that guy. He's just a nice man. He's just a good teacher. He was just a prophet. Come on, church. These are the lies that are out there. These are the lies that are deceiving a generation who are stepping into eternity with religion but no relationship with God because Jesus is our only connection to him. More now than ever, we need to be living this relationship so other people can see that it makes a difference in our lives. 
oh, Jesus is not who he said he was. He's just this, that, or the other thing. But he's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only one who died on the cross. He's the only one who broke the power of sin. He's the only one who died in your place. He's the only one who rose from the dead on the third day. Only Jesus, amen? You know, the second lie that our generation has believed is that salvation can come by doing good works. Isn't that just the whole linchpin of religion? Just do good things. Be good. Do good deeds. And, you know, hopefully, you, you know, you do more good deeds than bad things, and God grades on a curve, and he'll let you in. That's religion. And multiplied millions of people believe that. Oh, I'm a good person, and the Bible says that none of us are righteous, not one. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags, that by the works of the law, no flesh can be justified. You and I can do good as much as we can, and yet we're still sinners, born into sin, under original sin, through Adam's sin. It came through our bloodline in our mother's womb. We were born with it, and as soon as we could, we confirmed that we were sinners by choosing to sin ourselves. Good morning, Full Gospel Center. Hey, the truth will set you free. It stings a little bit, amen? This is like back teen, you know, when you're a kid and your mom put it back. Anybody? Oh, the pain of healing. <laughs> so here's this situation where people are saying, well, Jesus is not who he said he was, and salvation comes by doing good works. Our generation has peddled this lie as well. Christianity is exactly the same as every other religious system. And the truth is, that's exactly wrong. In fact, Christianity is the only one that's different. And here's why it's different. Every other religious system in the world has, has salvation by works. You've got to earn it. I dare you, study every world religion, every cult, and you have got to earn your salvation through what you suffer, through the good deeds you do, by being you know, reincarnated a dozen times so you can get it right. Listen, every one of them systems will make you earn it. Christianity is the only one that's different. Biblical Christianity, amen? It's the only different one because it's the only one that offers salvation as a free gift to whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord. Come on, it's the only one... That that offers a savior to save us from our sins. <laughs> it's the only one that's different. Oh, it's all the same. All roads lead to God. No, every road's a dead end. The only road that leads to God is Jesus Christ. <laughs> so our generation gets deceived and it falls for these lies. You say, you know, why are people being deceived on such a massive scale? It doesn't seem to make logical sense. Pastor, the way you lay out the gospel, it seems so evident, so obvious, so easy to understand. Why is a generation missing it? There are two reasons. People are being deceived on a massive scale for this reason. Their consciences, their conscience. Remember, I talked about that inner witness, that referee. Their conscience has been seared by false teaching and sin. Listen to what 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3 says. By the, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith. Listen. Paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. They let themselves be deceived. Verse 2. By means of hypocrisy of liars, searing their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men forbidding marriage and advocating abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared by those who believe and know the truth. So, you know, some of the marks of religion there, deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And what happens? The conscience becomes seared. Did you ever meet someone whose conscience was seared where they could sin in, in the most vile ways and it didn't seem to affect them at all? God help us if we get to the place where our consciences are seared, where we've seen so much sin and we've entertained so much compromise that our conscience becomes seared. Notice verse 3 lists one of the, the, the uh, signs and the keys of those who are religious rule keepers. It's a, it's a biblical red flag. They forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from food. So it's, it's legalism. It's unbiblical, but yet it's branded as spiritual. People fall away, people get deceived, people allow themselves to be deceived, and the, their consciences become seared. The second reason such a massive amount of people are missing the truth of the gospel is this. Their constant rejection of the truth has given them over to believing a lie. 
You see, God will not strive with man forever. Oh, it's quiet. Oh, I thought I can just, you know, keep pushing the envelope and God will just, you know, and I can just get away with it and, uh, you know, he'll forgive. Listen, God will not strive with man forever. There are some people that God reaches out to them and they reject him and they reject him and they reject him till their hearts harden to the point where their consciences are seared. And then what? Then their constant rejection of the truth allows them to believe a lie. Why? Because they've rejected the truth so much that now they've accepted the lie. Listen to what 2 Thessalonians 2 uh, 10 through 12 says it answers this with great accuracy it says and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so that they should be saved for this reason god will send upon them a strong delusion so that they will not believe the truth with, with a false lie in order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness What is the word of God saying? Keep rejecting the truth, keep rejecting Jesus, and eventually you'll believe a lie, a strong delusion. Did you ever look at people and see what people who are lost believe? Did you ever listen to what they believe and think, how can anyone who's rational and intelligent believe those things? Now, I I know that they believe, you know, many times, hang on for a sec. That's better. Many times people look at Christians and go, well, you, what you guys believe is crazy, a virgin birth, raising from the dead, Jesus is coming back. That's crazy stuff. But really, th- that's, the tr- that's the truth of what's going to happen. Really, what they believe is crazy. Do you know people believe we came from monkeys? That there was a big bang and out of nothing came something. I had an argument with someone who was a science guy, and I love science too. If I believe science is just proves the the glory of creation and the creator amen i don't reject science but i have some argument and he's arguing with me that something can come out of nothing oh something comes from nothing all the time throw a bunch of parts in a bucket shake it around leave it there for a million years and a watch will appear that's crazy evolution that they teach as gospel is a theory with so many holes in it that it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does in creation The mathematical probability that everything came from nothing is such a huge number that it takes more faith to believe that than, yeah, a creator created everything and put it in order. Hello? We came from monkeys, right? Well, there's no transitive form. There's no half monkey, half man that led to man. There's nothing. There's a gap in the middle. They've been looking for it. They've they've been looking for that transitive form, but there is none because God created everything in order. Come on, Christian, understand. You know, many times they, they, they get intellectual and they cite their stuff and it's garbage. And we just sit there, oh, that sounds really smart. I don't know what to say. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. God made man from the dust and he breathed life. <sighs> the breath of God, pumina, pumped him up, ah, made him a living soul. Oh, that's easy to believe. I know I'm created. I know I was fearfully and wonderfully made. I know that I was knit together in my mother's womb. But people constantly reject the truth and their consciences become seared. People constantly reject the truth and they're given over to a strong delusion and they believe all these lies. Oh, abortion's just a choice. It's just a clump of cells. It's a lie. Our generation has believed lies. Sexuality is a free-for-all. Do whatever you want, whatever makes you feel good. No one can tell you no. God created order. (laughs) So people are deluded and people are tricked by false teaching and false prophets and all of these rejections of the truth sear their conscience and allow them to believe things that are just deception. Now understand this text tells us and guarantees us that there are two things that will precede the return of Jesus Christ. These two things have to happen. He says, let no one deceive you, for it will not come, say it will not come, unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness 
is revealed by the son, the son of destruction. So there's two things here. The first is the apostasy, and then the man of lawlessness, who's the Antichrist. By the grace of God, we're going to talk about apostasy today, and next week we'll cover the Antichrist. Next week's going to be all about the Antichrist, so come and you know, bring your helmets, and we're going to have a good time. But let's talk about the apostasy. The, the first thing that, you know, he says is guaranteed to come is the apostasy. Now, you know, you might hear pasta and you think this is good. <laughs> come on, laugh a little. It's good for you. But it's not good. It's not the good pasta. It's the bad pasta. It's apostasy. It's a falling away. Now, let me just say some things about the return of Jesus Christ. We need to understand that hopefully you have your paper in your hand that talks about the second coming of Christ. The return of Christ will take place in two parts, and that's why you have that chart in your hand. The first part will be the invisible surprise coming of Jesus to collect his bride. He was going to snatch the church up, remove the restrainer from the earth. All hell's going to break loose, and what will happen is the great tribulation will start at that point. So first he comes, and only the church sees him. He takes us away. What a mess this world is going to be when God removes every bible believer born-again Christian, spirit-filled, Holy Ghost, man and woman of God in one shot. Come on, wake up. Can you imagine what the world is going to be like without Christians on it? Could you imagine what, um, look at how ugly America is right now. People want to divide over everything, fight each other, overthrow the government, start war, start race wars, all of this stuff. And the only thing that's restraining that is the Holy Spirit in you and I. Once the church is removed, I, I don't, man, you just don't want to be here. The second part of his coming will be the glorious appearing when he comes and every eye will see him. Now, I've given you this list here that has all the scriptures that have to do with his coming so that you can study and look how they fall into these two categories. And I want you to spend some time. You got homework. Hello? Do your homework, study that, take a good look at it, read those scriptures, let the Lord burn them into your heart, and then let that encourage you to live ready for his coming, amen? The second time, the glorious appearing, he will come, everybody's going to see it, it's going to be on ABC, NBC, CBN, CBS, all the cable channels, ta-da, Jesus, here he comes, he's going to come back. He's going to touch his foot down in Israel, and then he's going to start the millennial reign from there, okay? So these are the two parts of his coming. Now, before that happens, there needs to be, before the church is extracted, there needs to be a significant falling away. And this proceeds it. It says, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. The Greek word for that is apostasia, and it means to defect from the truth. Very simply, it'll be those who believed in Jesus, and now they say, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. It will be those who say, I'm a Christian, and then when the cost of being a Christian kicks in, they go, I I'm not a Christian anymore. An apostasy, a falling away, a, a defection from the truth. Jesus said that, you know, the apostle Paul is speaking through uh, uh, here, and, and the Lord wants us to know that this is going to happen before he comes. Now you say, Pastor, do you believe in the great end time harvest of souls? Absolutely. And you say, well, why do you believe that? Because you can't have apostasy on a large scale unless you have, you know, evangelism on a large scale. Understand this. You can't fall away unless you first came. So I believe in revival. I believe in evangelism. I believe in the church age. We should be bringing in the harvest of souls. And I believe there are great times of harvest to come. You say, why? Because it fulfills the mission of the church. We're to preach the gospel to every nation, and then what? The end will come. It's consistent with the will of God. He's not willing that any should perish. And it's consistent with the parable of the sower in Luke 8. It's logical that apostasy would follow a great revival. Are you getting this? And when we say revival, revival's for the church. Revival means you need to be revived. When you revive something, it was alive, and now it's sketchy, and you get the Holy Ghost jumper cables, boom, it's alive again. It goes from lukewarm to hot, hello? You can't revive something that was never saved. That needs a revival. Not a revival. So yes, I believe in a great ingathering of souls. And you say, well, well, why would they all fall away? It's because of the parable of the sower. Do you remember the parable of the sower? He went out and sowed seed. And where? He sowed some on the hard ground, some on stony ground, 
and some on thorny ground and some on good ground. The hard ground, the stony ground, and the thorny ground, none of those seeds produce fruit, only the good ground. In any harvest that you have, in any seed that you plant, in any conversion that you have, the soil of the person's heart will prove if they are genuinely saved because they will remain and bear fruit. Come on. This is basic Christianity here. This is not like a a new doctor or anything. This is basic. This is Luke 8. This is the parable of the sower. The the global harvest of souls uh, will take place. But I want to say one thing to you. Do you know the greatest global harvest of souls described in the scripture will take place during the tribulation period? When the church is removed, you say, well, who, if there's no church, who's going to do that? It's going to be, in Revelation 7, the 144,000. They are sealed Jewish witnesses for God, and they're going to go around evangelizing. There's 12 of them, 12,000 of them from each of the 12 tribes in Revelation 7. They're going to go around, and they're going to preach the gospel right under the Antichrist's nose, and they're going to be saved. The tribulation saints will be saved and they'll be martyred, and they'll they'll be to the glory of God. But the great, you see, the church is not going to bring in the greatest harvest? No. When God shifts his focus back onto Israel and brings the remnant out, he's going to have these people bringing in a great harvest who won't bow to the Antichrist. Let's take a look at Revelation 7, because you guys are kind of looking at me funny here. Let's get some Bible behind this. Revelation 7, uh, 4 through 8. It says this, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel, from Judah, 12,000, from Asher, 12,000, and on and on it goes. So the, the number is compiled, with, and these are Jews. They're not Gentiles. They're not, it's not church age. It's during the tribulation. So these guys, are they're witnesses, and what do they do? They testify of the gospel. Now, there'll be a great harvest that they produce, Revelation 7, verse 9. Listen to this after these things i looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne before the lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hand and they cry out with a loud voice saying salvation to our god who sits on the throne and so you know you see these guys where did that great group of people come from they came from the as a byproduct of that evangelizing uh, 13 and 14 give us the answer to where they came from it says then one of the elders answered me these are clothed in white robes who are they and where have they come from I said to him, my Lord, you know, and he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. So, you know, there's this great harvest that takes place, and it takes place during the tribulation period, which shows even during persecution, uh, God cannot be stopped. It's just a powerful thing to think of. I believe in a great harvest, but the Bible tells us to be prepared for an apostasy, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. You say, what in the world would cause people to fall away from Jesus? Two things, and I'll close with this. The first thing that will cause those to fall away, now, they're going to fall away, and it's going to prove the type of soil in their hearts. The first is false doctrine and false teachers. Matthew 24, 24, listen to this warning from Jesus. For false teachers and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so that as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Jesus is warning what? That the deceivers would be so slick, so polished, such great speakers that they would almost be able to trick a spirit-filled believer, almost. Think about that. Think about people who you know, just love to be their ears tickled and to hear the doctrines that they want to hear. Think about the fact that before Jesus comes back, it'll be a Laodicean church that won't tolerate the true gospel, won't tolerate truth. And look around us and see, are we living in that time where people just, they don't want to hear the truth. They throw things right out of their denomination. They do things that are unbiblical and they just change everything. And they think, well, we're still the church. No, you're apostates. We see the the precursor of all this stuff. Beware of those who are sign seekers. There are some people that they don't want holiness. They don't want repentance from sin. They don't want, you know, to to walk in the spirit. They don't want to carry their cross. They just want to be entertained. 
there's churches that are just entertainment. They got professional hired worship teams and they got slick preachers, but it's not the gospel that's being preached. And they ordain lifestyles that are unbiblical and they ordain people in the pulpit that shouldn't be there. Come on, I'm just preaching the truth in church. (laughs) Doctrines of devils, false teachers, even if it was possible, the very elect would be deceived. Beware. Don't be a sign seeker. Be a Christ follower. Amen? The second thing that will cause a great falling away that will aid the apostasy is this, and it's something that we need to think about in this hour, persecution. When the church is persecuted, those who are not in it, 100% sold out to Jesus, will be offended, and they won't want to be part of the church. You say, how do you know this? Study church history. It's the way it goes. Persecution will always purify the church. Jesus is coming for a church without spot or wrinkled. You say, what gets the spots and the wrinkles out of the church? Persecution. When it costs you something to be in the house of God. I don't know if you're paying attention to some of the things that are going around in our country, but they've started to protest and boycott and persecute churches. And there was one church this week, I was watching a video clip where the the pastor went out to try and talk to people and they they punched him in the head. He was bleeding. They were making fun of him. And you say, oh my goodness, what's that all about? Well, I don't know all the details, but it looks like persecution to me. And I want to say to you today, what if there was a mob of people at our doors shouting that, you know, you're this and you're that and you Bible-believing Christians and you're narrow-minded and you're homophobes and you're all this stuff. What if there was a crowd an ugly crowd at our door, would you still come to church? What happens when it costs you something to come to church? It's amazing. I've been, I've been preaching here, you know, what is it, 26 years? And it's amazing the excuses that people will use not to be in church. Imagine if there was a mob outside the door. Imagine if it was now dangerous to come to church. Imagine if there was a social stigma attached to it. You say, why do I have to imagine all that? Because the Bible said it's coming. And persecution will purify the church. Why? Because only the people who really love Jesus will come and admit that they're Christians and worship God when it costs them something. (laughs) Sad to say, when the cost kicks in, some people are going to tap out and quit and say, I never signed up for this. I like that happy, clappy, goosebump, nice worship song, three-point sermon. But I didn't sign up for this. Do you see how persecution will purge the the dead wood out of the church and purify the church? His coming will not take place until the apostasy takes place. The apostasy will be the the result of false teaching and false teachers. It will be people who have let themselves be deceived because they weren't lovers of the truth. And when persecution comes, they'll be offended and they will walk away. And we will see the parable of the sower played out before our eyes. Stand fast. Get ready to stand. Don't shrink back. Be a light in the darkness. Though it costs us everything, we carry the cross to a generation that embraces darkness in the hope that some would be saved. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, I just thank you, Lord God, for these people who have come to church and and come out when it's easy just to shrink back and say, you know, I'm going to let fear set in and I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to stay away. But Lord, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And Lord, when these doors are to be opened, Lord, fill this place with your glory. Fill it with true believers. Fill it with people who are hungry for truth. Fill it with the lost that are ready to be found. God, use us to do it. I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, next time we're together, God willing, we're going to cover the second guarantee of what will happen, that the Antichrist will be revealed, the man of lawlessness. We're going to talk all about that next week. You say, when is Jesus coming? I don't know, but I want to live ready, and I feel my spirit stirring to get the people of God ready. And I pray this morning that you feel... uh, you feel an enthusiasm and a sense of urgency to reach everyone around you that you can. Amen.